it was pleasant surprise for me to invite you to this church because I was not expecting to come and speak to the British church. This time we had a World Assembly of God executive committee meeting in London. After that, I was supposed to speak to Korean congregation two days to leave. But suddenly, I found out that I was invited by a father steward. So this is a pleasant surprise, but I am very delighted to speak to you this morning. Most of people are asking me that how in the world could you have such a big church? Presently, I am pastoring a church which has 750,000 active members, and we have sent out more than 600 missionaries around the world, and I have. 600 associates working under me, and uh, we have 50,000 deacons, 1,400 elders, so we have quite a, a big crowds. <laughs> but uh, in 1958, I started with five person under a torn old American Marine tent. And the people ask me the secret how could I be used by God to build up this church? This morning, I just want to share with you some seven principles which God has blessed me so far. Number one, when I start church, always I start in my own heart instead of outside of my heart. Because church starts to grow in my heart. You know? The Holy Spirit comes and first put the visions and dream into my heart. Everything starts by the visions and dream. People can see the visions and dream, but you can see your visions and dream into your heart. The Spirit of the Lord comes and gives vision to young and the dream to old. In those days I was young, so God gave me the vision. Now I am 66 years old, old man, and now God gives me dream. But at the beginning, God put the vision into my heart in the slum area to have a church with 300 members. That was all I could accommodate. I couldn't think of a church which has more than 300. So that was the vision that God gave me. But I only had five persons at first. But day in, day out, I was living in that vision. I was saturated with that vision. and. Uh, when I embrace the vision, then vision embraces me and leads me and guides me to that goal. So by the series of God's intervention and miracle, by 1961, I had 500 members in my church, far beyond my visions and dreams. And then I said to God, Father, where should I go from this point? Then the Holy Spirit began to put another vision in my heart. You must believe for the 3,000 members. I could hardly believe my ears. 3,000, how can I handle 3,000? I can hardly now handle 500 members, but how can I handle 3,000? But still, the vision came into my soul, and I embraced that vision in 1961. Then the vision also embraced me, and the Holy Spirit began to work through that vision. I usually say that visions and dreams are the language of the Holy Spirit. If we want to communicate with the Holy Spirit, we must have the vision which the Holy Spirit put into our heart. Because the Bible says in Romans 4, chapter, that God raised the dead and calls those things which we not as if they were. So vision is the thing through which you can call those things which were not as if they were. So I embraced 3,000 members into my heart, and by 1964, I was preaching to 3,000. Then I said, from where should I go from this point? I said, if you believe for the 6,000, I may give you 6,000. Those days, the one Presbyterian church I had 6,000 members, which was the largest Presbyterian church in the world. So I embraced the vision of 6,000, and I was living in that vision day in, day out. 
and so many people thought that I was losing my mind because I was living in that vision still. I have only 3,000, but I was acting as if I were having 6,000. I walk as if I was, I was a pastor of 6,000. I preach as if I were having 6,000. I was completely engulfed by the 6,000 membership vision. Then, uh, 1969, I had active member of the 8,000. And so things were going on and on by the 30,000, 50,000, 100,000, then 300,000, half a million. Then God said, if you could believe, I could give you a million. So I am pregnant with a million people right now in my heart. <laughs> Have you ever seen any man pregnant with a million people? I am. And presently we have 750,000 members and we are marching towards the goal of the million members. Of course, if I add all of my branch works, we are far surpassing the million members. Uh, I usually send out my association with 3,000 members with $2 million to start their own work. So I've sent dozens of my uh, associates to start their own work with my members. So I, if I add all of those people, uh, we would have passed 1 million mark long time ago. So, you know, visions and dreams are the foundation of the beginning of the church growth. Bible says where there is no vision to people perish. And if you don't start church growth right now in your heart, then you will not have real church growth in your reality, in your circumstances. So church growth starts in the visions and dreams. When you pray, the Holy Spirit put the visions and dreams into your heart. And number two, to have church growth, one should have an extraordinary zeal to have a church growth. People are all having desire to see the goal accomplished in their lives. But to have a successful church growth, you must have an extraordinary desire, burning desire. Desire should be burning you through and through. Many people have a lukewarm desire. They say, well, God, if you want me to have this, okay, if you don't, that's fine with me. <laughs> well, if you have that kind of desire, you can't accomplish. You must have burning desire, extraordinary desire in your heart. Then you are pressured by your desire to kneel down and pray. If you have extraordinary desire, you are going to pray day in, day out. And those days I would pray for five hours every day. This desire was driving me and forcing me to kneel down before God and pray for the answer, for the intervention of God. And so pray hours and hours and hours. Many people are asking questions now, how many hours to pray? Well, now I am quite busier than those days. And, but still I try to pray from one to three hours every day. So stronger vision you have, stronger desire you have, then you would spend more time praying. Prayer is the foundation of the church growth. Through prayer, you can go into the spiritual realm and you can really receive God's gracious blessings in your life. So prayer is very important. In Korea, we are having a church growth, Christian growth of denomination because Korean churches are praying church. We have early morning prayer meeting, People get up at 4.30 in the morning and they come to church and pray and then they go to their job. And we have all night prayer meeting every Friday. Then South Korea, we have prayer mountain. You know, any higher mountain there you find a prayer mountain and people go to the prayer mountain, fast pray. We have one of the largest prayer mountain uh, in Seoul area and every day more than 3,000 of our members are praying in prayer mountain. Many of them are praying and fasting for more than 40 days. So prayer really shake the heaven and prayer break the power of Satan. We are constantly engaging in the spiritual warfare because the uh, devil with 
with the whole demon spirits uh, against the, the God's work. And we must overcome the unseen enemies, the presence of the demon and the host of the demon spirit. And through the prayer, we can overcome. For example, Japan is very near to Korea, but Japan has a lot of idols. They have a million idols, and it's very hard to preach to Japan. I spent more than 10 years preaching uh, Jesus Christ from the northern part of the Japan to the southern part of Japan, and uh, I could only establish 50 churches, and I could not be very successful. It was so difficult. And the Japanese people, I preach to them, but they have such a foggy mind. And they said, why should you accept the Western religion? We are Oriental, and Christianity is Western religion. Why should we accept Western religion? And I said, this is not Western religion. This is the, the unique gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. They said, uh, we have our own religion, our own God and we don't need the Son of God, Jesus. They are very confused. So one time, I had a great courage, and I chartered the airplane and took all of those leaders, unbelieving business leaders, to Korea. As soon as they arrived in Korea, their mind cleared, and one by one, they began to accept Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. In Japan, I could not help them. They had such a foggy mind. But in Korea, their mind become clear and they accepted Jesus. They asked me a question, how come that in Japan we not understand Jesus, but as soon as we come to Korea, we understand Jesus very clear. In Japan, they were occupied by the oppression of the demon spirit. And so they were confused. But Korean sky is very clear because of the praying Christian. The demon power is broken. One American chaplain uh, came to Korea and he stationed in an American uh, military base in Seoul and he was having tremendous success. Thousands of the military personnel were coming every Sunday and they were giving heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. But he was transferred from Germany to Korea. And he would come to my church and share his experience. He said, Pastor, while I was staying in Germany, I was preaching to the same American soldier, but the response was very, very little, and they would not listen to me. But I canned up all of my sermon and bring to Korea and refresh the sermon and preach the same sermon to the military people here in Korea, and they give heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. And how come? What's different? So I laughed. You are taking benefit of the Korean prayer. <laughs> because in Germany, because of the new theology in the German country, many Christians in Germany are not praying very much. And so the, the power in the air is very strong. But in Korea, you know, because of all of these prayers, the power in the air is broken. We have overcome the resistance of the devil. And you are get benefit Korean prayer. So he was having a tremendous success. It is real true. If you have an extraordinary desire to see church growth, you must engage the spiritual warfare. Because uh, the power in the air is there fighting against the God's movement. And the devil with the demon spirit will not like to see God's church flourish. So first, if you don't bind the strong enemy, you can't really run the house of the enemy. You can't bring the uh, unbelieving soul to Jesus Christ. There's a reason I would pray very, very much before I preach, because I should break the uh, spiritual power in the heaven. And when I get rid of the resistance, then the power of the Holy Spirit will be unleashed, and we could have the tremendous result. There's a reason in Korea we have great revival. Christian cross of our country, regardless of denomination, Protestant, Anglican, Catholic, we are all having great revival because we are all praying tremendously. I'll tell you one thing. My mother-in-law, she, she has gone to heaven now.
But my late, my mother-in-law was a great prayer warrior. She was praying day in, day out, and I actually learned how to pray by her. In the morning, cold winter, I would not like to get up out of the bed and go to come to church, but she would come, towel with icy water, dress it and put it on my face. <laughs> and I jump out of the bed and sit on the edge of the bed and say, Mother, kill me, kill me. One day I was uh, fast asleep and the telephone was uh, ringing and ringing and in groggy condition I took up the telephone and here my mother-in-law was speaking. I jumped out of bed. <laughs> I'm most afraid of God and my mother-in-law. <laughs> she says, son, what are you doing? I said, mother, I'm sleeping. We are waiting here now, 30 minutes, it's 5 a.m. Are you still Christian? <laughs> I was so frightened, I jumped out of bed and I brushed my teeth, took hold of my Bible, I rushed to church and ran on the platform and people were all laughing and rolling. When I look at myself, I was in my pajama. <laughs> so, you should pray to have a revival. With icy cold atmosphere in church, you can't have a warm working of the Holy Spirit. So, extraordinary desire drive you to pray, and prayer break the power of the Satan and bring the presence of the Holy Spirit. And number three, to have a church cross, one should really have faith in God. You know, circumstances are changing constantly, and many, many, many difficulties are rising while you promote the church growth. And if we would ever stand up on our five senses every day, our heart would be changed. We should not be vacillating because of the five senses and because of the circumstances or logical thinking. We must stand on the word of God and trust the God. If we change according to the volatile circumstances, then there will be no church growth. This is, has been my experience. When I was uh, building my present church, which sits with now 12,000 people, at that time I was building a church which sits with 7,000 people. And economically, it was very hard. Then uh, we had a 60 war in the Middle East, and there was oil shortage, and factories closing, and the bank was closing. I could not get any loan. And I was really hitting the rock bottom of my life. People were leaving the church, they were losing the job. And many, many people came to me and said, advised me to give up my dream. He said, you will never success, you will fail. And uh, when I see, I saw all of those difficulties. When I hear, I hear all the advice to leave the, the project. And when I think logically, I could not calculate the situation. I was in a terrible place, but uh, in my heart, I believed God, and I knew that God was greater than the circumstances, greater than all kind of the volatile situation. So I was unmoved. I was persisting my faith. Then God performed the miracle after miracle, and we could build church with 10,000 people. So. When you try to have God's work done, then the enemy will attack and you need tremendous determination to stay in faith. Many people say, I don't feel that if I have faith. People have misunderstanding about faith. People feel that uh, to have a faith, they should feel some kind of the warm sensation going through their backbone, or they should feel some trembling something like that. But, you know, faith is not emotion. Faith is your determination. Faith is a choice rather than your feeling. You choose to believe. And if you choose not to believe, then you are unbeliever. But if you choose to believe, then you are believer. It's a determination of, in your heart. It's not feeling. Even though you don't feel anything, you feel chilly. But if you could determine your heart, to trust God, then you have faith. And since you have the right to 
choose. There's reason Jesus Christ so many times rebuked those who would not choose to believe. Why don't you believe? Why don't you doubt? Jesus reprimanded. If they had no power to believe, then Christ Jesus would never reprimand them. You should decide to believe. So all through these years, 44 years, when I was giving church uh, uh, cross ministry, even though I could not feel anything, even though I could not see anything, I was determined to believe in God. Then God always worked with me together. The Bible says, it shall be done unto you according to your faith. Nothing shall be possible to them that believe. So believing is very important. In church growth, we should believe that God is going to give church growth. And then we have strong faith, unmoved. Then God's Holy Spirit moves in and miracle is created. And after that, to have a church growth, you must have real good fellowship with the Holy Spirit. Because anyway, church is not a human organization. Church is God's organization. And the uh, Old Testament, for 4,000 years, Father God came ahead in the world. Then God sent his only begotten son, Jesus. Jesus stayed here on earth for 33 years, and he died on the cross, redeeming us from the sin and death. Then he rose up, ascended to heaven, and on the day of Pentecost, he sent his Holy Spirit. So this is the age of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit represents Father God and Son Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit is the one who is the uh, leader of the church. And uh, he is the Lord of the harvest. And we are a laborer. So with us working together with the Holy Spirit, we cannot accomplish anything. We need a miracle intervention of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit is our wisdom, knowledge, power, everything. And Holy Spirit built the first church and he is dwelling in the church in, the, in our body right now. So to have a church we should have a very deep fellowship with the Holy Spirit and uh, participation with the Holy Spirit. He is our senior partner and we are the junior partner. And so we should recognize the Holy Spirit, and we should welcome Him, we should depend upon Him, everything. When I had 3,000 membership, I wanted to see church grow, but something happened and the church grow stalled. And I prayed very much, but, but the church was not moving on. And one cold winter day, after conducting early morning prayer meeting, I was sitting alone on the corner of the bench and I was praying and pouring out my heart before the Lord. Then I fell into trance and in a trance I was in the presence of God. I couldn't see God but I knew that I was in the presence of God. Glory filled the place. Then the voice of the Lord came into my heart. My son, do you want to see church grow? His father. Then God said, you asked you answer to my question, uh, uh, my, my question. I said, Father, please ask me. You see, suppose Israelite had gone out to the wilderness to catch quail with bare hand. How much quail do you think they might have caught? I said, well, in the wilderness, there would be not many quails and with a bare hand. How could they, could they catch quail? I think they would have caught a dozen and many of them would die by sunstroke. Then God said, then when I sent my wind, how many quail did they catch? I said, well, the quail were falling like a dust upon their camp. And God said, do you think I can do the same thing nowadays? I said, of course, you are God, you can do anything. Then God said, you are using all of your, your human strength. You are pushing and pulling to have a church growth. But now you come to the end of your struggle. Why don't you depend upon the Holy Spirit? When I send the wind of the Holy Spirit, sinners would fall upon your church like a dust. And I said, God, do that. Do that, please. Then he said, have the fellowship 
communion with the Holy Spirit. And I walk out of my trance. So I rushed up to my office and I look into the Bible, Second Corinthians chapter 13, verse 13. The love of God and, uh, and the grace of Jesus Christ and uh, communion with the Holy Spirit be upon you. So I went into Greek lexicon. It was written that the koinonia hagio pneumatus, koinonia. So I look into the meaning of koinonia. It was fellowship and partnership. And there I found tremendous revelation from the Lord. Up until that time, I did not treat the Holy Spirit as a real person. Of course, in theological seminary I learned, but actually I was taking the Holy Spirit as an influence of God. And I was not really treating it as a, a person. So I was careless. I was just trying to use the Holy Spirit instead of being used by the Holy Spirit. So I knelt down before the Holy Spirit. I still Holy Spirit confess my sin of neglecting you. I had mistaken about your personality. You are a real person, greater person than my own self, my wife, and my family. And so from today, I'm accepting you as a real person from heaven. I recognize you, I welcome you, I depend upon you. Dear Holy Spirit, let's go together. And at that time, some great sensation came into my heart. Up until that time, I always thought that I was having church growth. But there, I turned over all my burden to the Holy Spirit. He is my Lord. I am his laborer. So I began to look to the Holy Spirit. He is my comforter. Pneumatus. The comforter is a Greek language. Pneumatus. Pneumatus means that the one who is being called alongside from God to help us. So the Holy Spirit has been with me to help me for such a long time, but I did not recognize him as a person. If ever you recognize him person, then you should treat him as a person. You know, I always recognize my wife as a real person, so I will be very careful to treat her well. In the morning, I say, good morning, dear, I love you, you are pretty. Sometimes I don't feel to say that, but I should say that. She's a person. She's a person. And if I don't recognize her and appreciate her, then she would be depressed. If I continually doing that, she would leave me. So I should be very careful. When I was younger, I was easily forgiven, but when I get older, I'm not easily forgiven. I should be more careful. Since she's a person. So, the Holy Spirit is a person. He is with you and within you. He is the awesome God. So you should be very carefully treat him as a real person. And since that time until now, whenever I get up in the morning, I say, Good morning, dear Holy Spirit. I am. I love you. I appreciate you. I recognize you. And God's Father is working through you, and God's Son, Jesus Christ, is working through you. So we together, let's have a great time winning soul to Jesus Christ. And let's go together. And since that time, whenever I come to the platform, I said, Dear Holy Spirit, let's go. Let's go together. And while I preach, I really beg the Holy Spirit to inspire me. After the sermon, I sit down and say, Dear Holy Spirit, you really have helped me because I'm in a mess, but you really blessed me and made everything straight. And after having had such a fellowship with the Holy Spirit, new dimension of the power began to come upon my life. And when I stand on pulpit, I felt the presence of God stronger than before. Then soon, the 3,000 barrier was broken and my church was growing. From that point to 6,000, 8,000, 10,000. So, you know, having the fellowship of the Holy Spirit is very important. Holy Spirit is the senior partner. We are the junior. We must uh, uh, have a, a fellowship and discuss with you in every step. We are not given up as an orphan. 
He is here with us. Not only with only clergy people, but with the laity. The Holy Spirit is with us and within us. He is within His church, the body of Jesus Christ, throughout the world. But for such a long time, He has been neglected and He was mistreated. And there's reason he was, uh, he, he was grieved and he could not work. And many a times we put institution in the place of the Holy Spirit. And human ingenuity or wisdom in the place of the Holy Spirit. There's reason we don't have the miracle of God in this generation. When we have the presence of the Holy Spirit, you see the continuity of the working of Jesus Christ every day. Even before I come, last Monday here, one of our men came with a glorious testimony. He was dying from uh, uh, lung cancer together with uh, abdominal cancer. And doctor gave him up and he was dying person. And uh, he came to church, he listened to the preaching and he accepted Jesus Christ. He cried very much. He was broken and he confessed. He went to the prayer mountain and prayed and fasted for one week. And after one week, the Holy Spirit came upon him. And he felt the presence of the Holy Spirit so powerful in his life. And he heard a still small voice. Son, you are healed. From today, you are free from the cancer. He was overjoyed and he came down from the prayer mountain, he read scripture, whole Bible twice, then he was praying, and he was asleep, and he felt that some blue light was hitting him, like lightning, going through his body, and he woke up, and he was so happy, he says, this is like a Malachi, that the, 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 the healing light come through the righteous sun, so he said, I was healed. And then he was taken to hospital and the doctor checked over him thoroughly. And the doctor could not find any vestige of cancer left in the lung and, and abdominal places. He was completely healed. So when you have the presence of the Holy Spirit, you have the continuity of the working of Jesus Christ. Many people say that how come you have such a tremendous church? So many people come to church church and they really experience Jesus Christ in our church. Not because of me, no, because of the presence of the Holy Spirit. They come, they cry, they pray, they depend upon God and the Holy Spirit manifest in the name of Jesus Christ. And uh, many people receive peace, joy, happiness, righteousness, sanctification, and healing and miracle answer from the Lord. So, in this 21st century, we need that kind of experience because we have been hearing about God so much. We've been talking about God so much. Now people need to experience God. They need God instead of hearing about God. And so the Holy Spirit is answer. When you recognize Him and welcome Him, adore Him, and accept Him, He will start to work because you should not depend upon your feeling. He is God. God is beyond the sensation of your feeling. So He is beyond your senses. Many people are too much depending upon the senses. And when they feel good, oh wow, God is here with us. And when one feels uh, chilly, oh God is not here. No, it is not so. He is God is beyond your five senses. He is always here through his miraculous presence and by faith he is working. And then uh, my church was beginning to come through my preaching. I went out to the slum area and I confronted with many difficulties because uh, when I went there, people were living from hand to mouth, and there were so many drug addicts and alcoholics and, and broken homes and so many thugs in there. I did not know how to handle because it was after the Korean War. 
our society was totally destroyed. And uh, we were living in a miserable situation. And I'll tell you one example. I went to one family. They were refugees from North Korea. The, the husband was a confirmed alcoholic for 10 years. His wife was dying from a sickness, heart trouble and stomach trouble. And they had nine sons and they were on the street, shining the shoes and picking the pocket. What money they make, they bring home and the father would take all the money out of their hand and drink. So they were in a miserable situation and they were living in a small one room. They were plainly beggars. So I knocked on the door and the lady opened the door and looked at me, who are you? I said, I'm a preacher from the other part of the town and I want you to believe in Jesus Christ. And she laughed. Then she said, you mean that I believe in Jesus? She said, is Jesus real? I said, yes. If you believe in Jesus, you go to heaven, and if you don't believe in Jesus, you go to hell. She, uh, she was very angry. She had glaring eyes. She said, if Jesus were truly living, then why wouldn't he give me a part of that heaven right now here? If he would give such a wonderful place beyond there in heaven after death, then why wouldn't she give a part of the heaven right now here on earth? Why wouldn't he prove him, prove to me that he's alive and he has the real heaven there? He says, you are a liar. You preacher, you are a liar. Show me heaven. Give me part of heaven. She said, to me, heaven is uh, another blanket. To me, heaven is a bushel of the rice. To me, heaven is uh, a better home. And if Christ could not provide me with those kind of heaven right now here, he said, how in the world could he give us heaven beyond the death? You are a liar. You look at my children. They are not going to school. They are pickpocket. They are robbers. My heart is broken seeing them, but I have no answer for their lives. But I said, still yet, if you don't believe in Jesus, you are going to hell. She laughed. She said, I'm already living in hell. What hard could I go than here right now? You look at me, my home. Am I not living in hell right now? I said, you are right. This is hell. She said, then don't preach about hell anymore. So I was thoroughly persuaded by her. Instead of preaching to her, she preached to me and I was convinced by her. I, I came back like this. And I came back to 10 church and I came to the platform and I met them and I said, Lord, I have nothing to preach to these people because they, they don't believe in hell, heaven and they are not afraid of going to hell. And my preaching will not influence them at all and if I can't meet their need right now, if I can meet their need right now, how can I help them? Is gospel just uh, easier or uh, real? And I cried, then I opened the Bible, and I began to read the full gospel as if I were heathen. And Christ was preaching a different gospel that I preach. Christ was uh, forgiving the sins. He was healing the sick. Casting out devil, feeding the starved, raising the dead. Then you say that kingdom of heaven is at hand. Who would live in the kingdom of heaven? Because they would experience the kingdom of heaven there. But I would only preach that Jesus did 2,000 years ago. But then where is Jesus? Is he out of the business right now? Where is Jesus? I have no answer. I said, Father, can I preach like Jesus? If I don't preach like Jesus, if I don't meet middle people like Jesus, then I would be hypocrite. I would not, I would be only preaching religion instead of the salvation. I was in great struggle in my own heart. I cried very much and I read scripture again and again. And whenever I read, I saw Christ and not religion. You know, I was a Buddhist, born and raised up as a Buddhist. And when I was 17 years old, I was dying from terminal tuberculosis. 
And I become desperate and I was praying to the Buddha every day, every day. And I was chanting to Buddha every day till, till I feel, felt spooky. I chanted and chanted and chanted. But nothing happened. I said, Father, is, is Jesus different from Buddha? Is he same like Buddha? I was Buddhist. I was dying from tuberculosis. And I prayed to the Buddha day, day in, day out. Nothing happened. Buddhism is a religion, meticulous, beautiful, wonderful, but dead. And uh, when I become terrible, when I could hardly grasp the air, I was vomiting up the blood continually. I said, oh God, universe, if there were God in the universe, come and touch me and help me. I don't know about this Buddha, if he is having a long travel or he's out of job. No answer comes. I'm desperate. I don't like die. I'm too young to die. I'm 17 years old. God, if you were there in the universe, come and help me. Then less than one week, one Christian schoolgirl visited my home and she witnessed about Jesus Christ. I turned her down and I said, no, no I'm a dying person. I don't like to change my religion. I have already religion, Buddhism. Religions are all the same. She says, no, Christianity is not religion. This is the message of salvation. And she told me about Jesus, then she left. Then yesterday she came again, then again, then again. Finally, I was very tired. And I bowled her up one day, and she knelt down beside me, and she was crying. I saw the tears rolling down on her cheek. She was crying for my salvation. And my heart was moved, not because of her eloquence, but because of her tears. I said, look, you are Buddhist, but no Buddhist came and cried for you. But this is a Christian girl. She's not related to you. She's not your fiancé. Why should she cry for you? I think Christian has faith, love. So I said, don't cry. I now know that you Christians have love. I'll become a Christian for you. <laughs> I was so lonely. And I was so comforted because of her love. And she was throwing up her hand and she says, praise the Lord. And she gave her Bible to me and says, read this Bible. So I opened the Genesis and she snatched the Bible away from my hand and said, please don't start from Genesis. <laughs> she said, you are too sick to finish Revelation. <laughs> that was right, because I was too sick. So she opened Matthew. And so I, I received the Bible and I began to read Matthew, Abraham, Bigot, Isaac. I said, bigger Jacob, Jacob, bigger Judah. I said, I said, lady, this is all begetting story. I'm well versed in Buddhist Bible, and the Buddhist Bible is very logical, very deep, and very erudite. And uh, this Bible is all telling about the begetting story. And uh, I said, this is very depressive. I'm a dying person. She said, do you complain because fish is born? I said, no, I saw that bone and eat the flesh. She said, well, the Bible has a lot of bones, just the saw the bone and eat the flesh. That was tremendous advice. So, oh, that's right. Then I saw out those, uh, those bones and I would only eat the flesh. And uh, I kept on reading the scripture and I was amazed because it was so diff different from Buddhist Bible. This Bible was not talking religion or, or logic. This Bible was talking about one person, Jesus Christ. And this person was not normal person. He was God in the person. He hated sin, but he loved the sinners and forgave sin. He hated the sickness, but he loved the sick and healed. He hated the devil, but he loved the demon possessed and delivered them. He hated their poverty, but he accepted the poor people and fed them. He was against the death, but he raised a dead person. And there I saw my hope, because I was desperate. Doctor gave me up, my religion gave me up, and I needed a miracle in my heart. I was in desperate need, and there I found the person who could meet my need. There I accept Jesus, because I had never been to church, I had never heard any sermon by preachers, just by reading the scripture. And in that 
high school girl will not come back home because her burden lifted. And she just left the Bible with me. Reading the Bible, I knelt down before Jesus. I said, Mr. Jesus, if you were truly son of God, prove me now. Come and touch me and heal me. And when you heal me, I'll become your servant. You will get tremendous benefit out of me. <laughs> I tried to feed him to heal me. But miraculously, Christ came to my heart and I was touched. I had great peace and joy. Oh, the peace. You know, I had been a Buddhist for more than 10 years together with my father. Every morning we would sit down and we would meditate, meditate, meditate. But uh, sometimes we felt uh, we had some peace, but soon uh, the peace uh, evaporated. But this time, when I was praying to Jesus, the peace came and overtook me. It was not a human created peace. This was miraculous presence of peace and great feeling of glory came to my heart. I jumped up. I said, oh my God, something happened. Something happened in my life. From that time, I had a great faith in my heart. I knew that I was going to live, not die. I knew. Still, I was coughing up blood. I was running the fever. But in my spirit, I knew that I would overcome the difficulty. Doctor told me that I would only live three to six months, but after three months still I was alive, and after one year I survived and I was completely healed. Since that time, it was 17 years of age, now I'm 66 years old, the tuberculosis never relapsed in my life. I've been healthy all through these years. So that was the beginning of my Christian travel. Out of my dire need, Christ came and met my need. And then I went to the Bible college and I studied. But our professors were not teaching or meeting the need. They were teaching me theology and philosophy and all of those things. And I was dying for those years in school. Because uh, uh, in the school, uh, it's just a theory, not a, uh, reality. And when I come into ministry now, when I try to help them through our, my theology and the theory, I could not help them. And I met this situation. So I prayed and prayed and prayed. The Spirit said, Just as I met your need, you must help her meet her need through Jesus Christ. So I was really armed and I went to her. I knocked on the door. She threw open the door and she was very angry. Why do you come back again? I said, lady, do you want to see your husband healed from alcoholism? Do you want to see your nine children all sent to school and get proper education? Do you want to have health? Do you want to have some uh, uh, hygienic home? Do you want to have those things? She says, who could give me that kind of home? Jesus Christ, Son of God. She says, where is he living? I said, follow me. And this time she was not resisting. She came out and she took the sandal and she followed me. And we were going through me and ring, Rish Perry, and finally we came to the old town, Kent Church. My church was American Marine uh, tent. And they used and they gave up and I took it up and I put it as a church. So it's standing like this. I had a makeshift cross put on in front of the tent. And I threw few seats of the rice mattress on the ground. So it's, it's a miserable place, a refugee camp. And I stood before my tent church. She said, where is your church? I said, this is my church. She took the flip and looked inside and saw all of those rice mattress on the floor. She looked at me. And she put her hand on her stomach and she laughed. And she said, so, you are not better off than I am. <laughs> so I said, yes, I am. I said, I need Jesus as much as you need. Jesus is the source of all the provision. And even though we are in this situation, this reason all the more we need Jesus. Because uh, the way to do people, they don't need Jesus. But since we are all in a terrible situation, 
we need Jesus to meet our need. And since I was very practical and pragmatical in my approach to her, she accepted and she began to attend our church. We prayed for three months for the healing of her husband. And every time when he prayed, her husband would come in drunk and stupor. And when he walked into the same church, the, the, the smell of alcohol filled the tent. He said, oh, pastor, since you started to pray for me, the, I love alcohol more than any time else. It, it, it's all more atheistic. And he, he was flouting me. But we kept on praying. And after three months, he was completely delivered from alcoholism. Then uh, uh, his friends were so happy and finally he found a job and he received salary and he brought uh, one sack of the rice home. Family gathered together, they cried, they cried. She took one tenth of rice, so one, one tenth is God's. Then she pulled back again, no, we need this rice. <laughs> then I realized, no, 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 then when God will not bless us, we will be terrible situation, she took one thing back again. And so the evening till early morning she was pouring in, pouring back. <laughs> then uh, early morning, prayer morning, prayer meeting time came when she, uh, the church bell rang. In the dim of courage she took the rice and money and she was coming and she was crying so hard that she fell down many a times in rice paddy and gathered together with dust and the mud and rice. When she came to church, I could not see any rice left. <laughs> it the mud. And she was crying, she said, God knows our situation. Why, why would he like to rob the rice away? I said, this is not robbing. One test belongs to God. That's God's possession. It's not yours. And if you return to God, his possession, then he's going to keep you blessing. So that time she kept on being in the right and praying. And by the help of government, she was given a small plot of land and they got the loan and built a nice home. And they could send their children all to school. And now three of their children are ministers. And I changed the whole life of their family. And uh, I said, this is Christianity. It's not talking about religion. Christianity should be practical and pragmatical. Church should rise up, meet the need of people. And so, through giving the hope to the people and meeting the need of the people, she was to grow. You know, I'm desperately trying to give the hope to the heart of the people. We are not living in Old Testament time. Our pulpit is not in the Mount Sinai, where the God's lightning is coming and the uh, roaring sound judgment come. No. We have our pulpit in the Calvary, where Jesus hung upon us on the cross and giving us the forgiveness and the love and mercy. So through the blessing of Jesus, through the redemption grace of blood of Jesus Christ, I try my best to give hope to the people, hope to the sinners, hope to the sick, hope to the desperate, hope to the dying. And by giving the hope and by giving them the practical and pragmatical help, people rise up and they meet Jesus and they overcome. So far, we have not received any outside help. All those poor people, after believing in Jesus, they rose up and they received tremendous hope and dream and faith and worked hard. And we have come to this far. Now we have built our church, so world's largest church. We see 12,000 people. And uh, we have dozens of our uh, branch churches. We are having a simultaneous service through the satellite and uh, we have 600 missions working all around the world and we have the largest prayer mountain in the world and we have the largest social, we are helping young people you know, who could not go to school, bring them and give them free uh, lodgings and uh, uh, training to get uh, certificates as a technician and we have operate uh, all the folks home and uh, we have two universities and we are operating daily newspaper, Christian daily newspaper, 
We have the one million circulation every day. This is uh, having a tremendous influence over the government, business, world, society, because we are carrying the gospel of Jesus Christ together with secular news. Powerful. And God just opened the door of heaven, pour out the blessing upon the church, because we believed in living Jesus Christ, and we believed in Jesus who made our daily need. Christ Jesus, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And so many downtrodden people would come to church and hearing Jesus, and accepting Jesus. They become born again, and they receive the fullness of the Holy Spirit. They be the Word of God, and we pray together, and God intervenes, and the life changing comes. And uh, I'm not saying this uh, in a flaunting way, but uh, humbly, I want to give all the glory to the Lord that we now have more than 50,000 millionaires in our church. And most of them come in a, as a pauper, but through their faith in Jesus, God has been blessing them. So I've been trying to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ to give hope to the people. And finally, our church is growing because we are using laity, cell system. You know, people come to me and say, how do you handle 720,000 people? It's easy. I uh, typologically saying that I have the Peter's ministry and James Jones ministry and Paul's ministry. You know, uh, allegorically speaking, Peter was called into ministry while he was casting the net. James and John were called into ministry while they were mending the net. And Paul was called into ministry while he was making the tent. So Peter's ministry means that you cannot get soul saved by fishing rod. Peter was casting the fish net and get a lot of fishes at one time. This is self system. Self system means that you raise up the laity and train them and, and help them to take care of the five to ten family in their home. This is a small group movement. Uh, and so one family uh, would open home and in the week they gather together, five to ten family together, and they have service there. They have testimony and fellowship and prayer together. And when the cell grows more than ten family, and they have cell split and another cell start and another cell start. So now we have 50,000 deacons and deaconesses. They are all cell leaders. So that means that we have 50,000 cell system. And these cells are all like a net. And I cast the net across our city and pull the net. Then we get a lot of fish there, a lot of soul. I don't win soul one by one. Many, many lay Christians, they are warming the bench only. But you should mobilize them. You should use them. When I especially come to the American Europe, the uh, church is afraid of using women. But I am using women. Two-thirds of cell leaders are all women. Women are wonderful, wonderful workers for the Lord. And most of them consist of church. And I think you European church is losing a tremendous trade because they don't use women. You know, I was amazed when I first came to the Europe, seeing that women are not used in the church. In Korea, for 5,000 years of history, women have had no voice at all. But Christian church began to free the women and use the women for church work because they are covered by the authority of the pastor. And so, by the covering of the authority of pastor, they could do any work being delegated by the pastor. So in my church, I use women, and women are wonderful workers. I call them tele women, because women are talking constantly. They are talking in places like talking in telephone. So I call them tele women. They are talking about Jesus wherever they go. And oh, they win soul so wonderfully. And by using the women and by using men together, our cell system grows like a, like a burning bush. 
fire of the Holy Spirit burn through the society. And uh, this cell system is not only working as a fellowship group, but in a, in a way it's a social security. When we had a great flood, and many people lost home in so area. And uh, unbelievers, they were all going to school and cinema uh, as, a, uh, as a temporary place to stay. But through a cell system, we have sold them all to our family. And they, instead of going to the cinema and the school, they come home through the system. And all of those one who lost home and uh, difficulty, they were absorbed to home and we took care of them. So naturally, they feel great love of God through cell system. And through cell system, we are touching society and our members. And the cell system is like a cobweb of love. Many people say that, how come that Christian would come to your church, would not leave your church? Of course, they'd like to leave our church, but they were caught by cell system. I tell you one example. One uh, cell leader, lady was so wonderful and excellent, and, she, and her neighboring house, they had traveled because of the hippie son, and uh, the, the the family were crying for the hippie son. But this cell leader met him and prayed for him and loved him. He was converted and he began to attend cell meeting. So naturally the cell leader invited their parents to come to cell meeting also. And they attended cell meeting. They enjoyed testimony. They enjoyed fellowship and prayer. Then they said, let's go to our mother church. Our pastor preached a wonderful message. Let's go. So because out of appreciation, for the cell leader who changed their son, they accompanied the cell leader together to church. But you know, you know our, our church is Pentecostal church, we are not Anglican church. Anglican church is more or less very silent and solemn, but we are noisy. So, so we were having, we clapping the hand, singing and praising the Lord. As we supposed the church was a solemn place, but this is so noisy, like a marketplace. People are shouting and crying, and this, we love the sermon, but we don't like to come to this church. This church. Let's, let, let's not come. But they were caught by the cell leader. Every Saturday, she would call her, their family. Tomorrow is Sunday. Don't make any plan. I'm waiting before your house. Let's go to church. So finally, they could not stand any longer, the husband and wife made decision to move away from that area. <laughs> so contacted a real estate person and sold the house in secret and they moved to another part of our town. And when cell leader came, in her ignorance, they left the place. So she went down to the town hall and found a new address where they went. <laughs> She bought the new address on Sunday and turned into our church administration office. And uh, the administration office fed, fed that into our computer. And our computer uh, 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 gave the information about the cell leader who were conducting cell system in new area where they removed. So they gave the information to the cell leader. The family from this area moved to your area. And you, you, under your responsibility, you go. So they moved to, the, to another town, part of the town, and they cozily settled down. It's now we are away from that church. They are wonderful people, but we don't like them. And we are now safe here. Then they heard some knocking on the door. And when the couple went out to open the door, here a couple, dozens of people carrying the flowers and the candles. They said, welcome to our area. Who are you? Oh, we are the cell leaders and cell members of the Full Gospel Church. They cry. They all come to home and decorate the flowers and they love them, hug them, and they have cell ministry. They said, now, we can't avoid this church. If you'd like to avoid this church, either we immigrate to America or to heaven. Then they said, if we can't avoid, then let's just act full time in this church. They come and they receive cell leader training. Now they are a wonderful cell leader in our church. <laughs> they are caught by the hope we have of love. If you have this system, people come to church and they can't leave the church. In generally many churches, so many new 
converts are flowing into church, but so many are moving from back door. You must close back door. How do you do? By the whole web of love. By love, you keep them. So, church is supposed to increase and grow. And by using the laity, you know, all of those uh, lay Christian men and women who have the desire to work for the Lord, they have the place to work in a uh, traditional church, even though they have desire to work for the Lord, they have no place except a Sunday school teacher or something like that. But you have certain limited numbers who could work. But when you have selfish, you have desire, you start from your home. You open your home and you start to invite neighbors and you start to have service. And you, you, you will go get into the ministry. And so the small group movement, or cell system, is thriving in our church, in, the, in Korea, in Anglican church, in Catholic church, in other Protestant church. We are all having a cell system. And so we are having Peter's ministry. Then we need James and John's ministry. James and John were called while they were mending that net. You know, the cell system is here and get broken. Cell leaders become sick, or cell leader move to other towns, and cell leader become uh, slackened, and they become lazy, and they give up the cell system. Then the that is broken, and the whole school of fish whoo, move out through the hole out. So right away, you should rush to that place and patch up the broken net. And to do that, I hire so many ministers, 600 ministers. They are the James and Jones. They are men in the net. They are. Uh, I appoint them to certain numbers of the cell uh, groups and they constantly watch them and if any cell leader uh, uh, and, uh, and play hooky and they, uh, their net is broken then this minister should go and mend that place. Then Paul I am the Paul because I am tent maker. You know when they bring all the fish in the tent then I feed them. I feed them with the word of God. And pastor should not go around and winning souls and visiting homes and all of those kinds of things. I am pastor of 750,000 people, but I have tremendous amount of time. I travel around the world almost every month conducting the meetings. And when I am home, about two days every week, I go out to play golf. And they say, where do you find your time? I delegate my ministry to my associate and my laities. You know, cell leaders, they visit the home, they counsel in the place, and my associate, they go and mend the broken cell. And my job is preaching, the supplying the word of God. So I read scripture, study, pray, and I, I rest, and then I carry on the work of God. So these 150,000 people will not become any burden in my life because of the lay leaders, lay Christians who are working together with me. And now, I studied the cell ministry in 1964, first the time in the world. But uh, throughout the world now, the small group movement is uh, spreading like a wildfire. And this is the answer, how to give ministry to the laity, how to work together with the laity to bring church growth. And through these seven means, God has been blessing me and my ministry during 44 years, and God has given this tremendous church, and I give all the glory to God. And this is my simple testimony. Some of my testimony would agree, and some of my testimony you would not agree. Anyway, I want to become a blessing to you. God bless you. Thank you very much.